This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 21 of season 3 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, May 21st, 1910, and I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford that week. The week starts with the About Town section. Our good all-around businessman, Fred L. Snow, who was a large owner of the northerly layout of Westford, was the recent purchaser by auction of the pasture on on Scribner Hill, just over the Westford line in Tingsboro. This locality is interesting to many because Scribner, Scribner Hill was named after Reverend Matthew Scribner, minister of the First Parish Church in Westford from 1778 to 1788, when he removed to this wild rocky hill, cleared the land, erected buildings, which have long since yielded like the builder to the friction of time, but the seller still remaining to testify of what once was here. He died in 1813. The large bouquet of flowers on the table in front of the pulpit of the Unitarian Church last Sunday was the remembrance of friends in Nashua who removed from town in 1858, but never forgetting the old First Parish Church, which was her early church home. Neither have the older residents forgotten the hospitality and culture of the David C. Butterfield family, residing at what is now the old Abbott Homestead. They will renew old-time associations with us at the festival exercises at the dedication of the Soldier's Monument on May 30th. A new copper wire is being laid on the line of the Stony Brook Railroad. This is the nearest to copper stock holdings the town has been able to locate. Miss Lucinda Prescott is entertaining friends from the far down land of potatoes, Warren, Maine. Westford and West Chelmsford were well represented at the choir festival held in Lowell on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings in aid of the playground fund. It was well worth the while for more. The next uh, couple paragraphs are called entertainment. There is no reason to, reason to too busy to prevent the fortnightly club from having its recreation and entertainment. The last one, but not the last to be, was full of suggestions of what a world this might be if we but did our duty. An eminent writer has said, do that which is assigned thee, and thou canst not hope too much or dare too much. This is a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on self-reliance that was published in 1842. And Emerson seems to be a favorite uh, author of Samuel Law Taylor, the correspondent that writes the About Town section of the Wardsman. The fortnightly club is obedient to, to that thought, and it was exemplified in a personal way by reading Mrs. Walter Wyman, song Edward Gamblin, reading Mrs. Charles Flavel, reading Mr. and Mrs. Horace Gould. This was followed by the one-act drama entitled Pleasant Surprise, which was full of life, originality, and sky-high hits. The science was laid, I'm sorry, the scene was laid in Judge Anderson's private room. The cast was Judge Anderson, Charles Blodgett, Mrs. Anderson, played by Mrs. William Wyman, Ralph, son of the Judge of Judge Anderson, played by Fred Blodgett, Lucille, daughter of Judge Anderson, played by Miss Estella Glenn, Daisy, niece of Judge Anderson, by Miss Lillian G. Wright, and Phillips, the coachman, played by William Wyman. The club will miss one of its more recent helpers, Miss Estella Glenn, who has removed to her home in Long in Long Island, having spent the winter in East Groton. Also, one of its younger older members, Miss Lillian G. Wright, who has accepted a position as teacher in the public schools of Andover. The next section is the Westford Center section. 
Miss Grace Lumbert is at home again after spending two months in Covington, Virginia. She reports that Mr. and Mrs. Anderson and the little Anderson heir as all very well. This is a reference to Reverend William E. Anderson, who had served the Methodist Church at Graniteville from 1905 to 1907 and would return to Westford to serve the Methodist Church again from 1919 to 1924. Among minor improvements, Wright and Fletcher have placed a fine new gilt-lettered sign in front of their store. And uh, Ellen Hardy has placed a similar sign there now. It's the same store. It's the store that was is now Muffins on Main. Workmen have been grading and making a sidewalk at the west end of the common near the new Soldiers Monument, which adds much to the appearance of the vicinity. Okay. Mrs. Houghton, G. Osgood, who has been in frail health for the past year, is visiting Mr. Osgood's sister, Mrs. Lyman Wilkins, in Cambridge. Austin Foss, F-O-S-S, has been having a heavy cold. The cold weather state coming north does not agree with him. Westford friends are extending their, congreg their congratulations to Mr. and Mrs. Chester M. Hartwell of, El of Littleton at the advent of a little daughter. Uh, her name was Dorothy Sheila Hartwell, born May 13, 1910. Mrs. Hartwell was formerly Miss Dorothy Sleeper of this village. Uh, she was the daughter of Dr. Sleeper, who served Westford in the early 1900s. Miss Mary Morin, our village nurse, is with Mrs. Hartwell. The concert to be held Wednesday evening at Abbott's Hall promises to be the best of its kind held here for some time. The artists are well known in musical circles and include, among others, Mrs. Oliver Wellington Priest of Portsmouth, Contralto, Miss Emma Engelman, Soprano, from the Whitney School, Boston, and Miss Vernie G. Lowe of the Emerson School of Oratory will be the reader. The next section is called Death. Sudden and violent death in our midst always comes as a shock to the community. Thursday night of last week, Charles Reed, it's spelled R-E-A-D in this um, item, this news item, but I believe he spelled it R-E-E-D. Charles Reed came to the village and after doing some errands, started for home about 9 o'clock and in some way drove into the catch basin being dug in front of J.C. Abbott's residence, uh, 45 Main Street. Men who were at Wright and Fletcher's store at 40 Main Street heard the crash and hurried to the scene and worked hard to extricate horse and man. The unfortunate man was underneath the horse. Dr. Blaney was among the first to get there and did all that was possible, but life was extinct, although some said he spoke when help first came. His life was crushed out by the horse. The hole was railed and lighted, and the evening was not, not very dark. Undertaker David L. Grieg was notified and took charge of the body. The funeral was held from his late home in the south part of the town Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, Reverend David Wallace officiating. The bearers were relatives in the family. Mr. Reed was a veteran of the Civil War and was 70 years of age. The next set, uh, paragraph is, is titled, Accident. Fred L. Shorey, S-H-O-R-E-Y, who with his team of horses has been working for W.H. Tarbell on the street repairs at the center, met with an unfortunate and painful accident on Friday of last week. While unloading stones for the new paved gutters, he got one of his arms crushed with a heavy stone. He was taken into Emory J. Whitney's house, and Dr. Wells summoned and later removed to his home in the south part of the town. The ligaments were torn at the elbow, making a very painful injury, and one that takes much time to heal. Much sympathy is felt for Mr. Shorey, for he has been rather unfortunate. About two years ago, when there was a dastardly run of horse stealing, he had a valuable horse taken from his barn, no trace of which was ever found. With sickness in his family and this last accident, he has had hard luck. The next section is the Tadmuck section. The Tadmuck Club being the ladies' club in Westford Center. 
The last meeting of the season of the Tadmont Club took place on Tuesday afternoon in the vestry of the Congregational Church. The more sober-minded and working sessions of the club are a thing of the past at this annual social with its atmosphere of pleasant festivity, agreeable entertainment, pretty decorations, and gowns and dainty refreshments. This year, it was a membership social of which there was a good representation and the gentlemen who have so kindly assisted with the season's program. The attractive decorations were the skillful handiwork of Elliot F. Humiston. Elliot Humiston, who was 16 years old at this time, seems to have been the go-to guy for party decorations in Westford, as he's mentioned frequently in that capacity. The platform was banked with a wealth of delicate spring greenery, apple and barberry blossoms, and lilacs. Lilacs and greenery also outlined the wide doorway between the two vestries and the sliding windows dividing the vestry and the auditorium. It made a charming setting for the artists of the afternoon, who were Mrs. Belle Harrington Hall of Lowell, reader, Miss Marie Pickering of Boston, soprano soloist, and Miss Marion E. Sweat of Westford, accompanist. Mrs. Hall completely won her audience with her sympathetic and intelligent interpretation of her selections. Her rendering of, quote, the universal angel, end quote, the theme of which was mother love, was particularly well done. Mrs. Hall also possesses the happy faculty of impersonating child life in various phases with pleasing fidelity. Miss Pickering, who was associated on the maternal side with Westford families, was an enjoyable acquisition to the afternoon's program. This is the second time this season that the club is indebted to Miss Sweat for her skillful services as a companist. Miss Loker, previous to announcing the afternoon's program, thanked all who had helped with the season's work in their different ways. Ice cream and cake was served at the close of the program. Ms. Loker was the president of the club, of the Tadmont Club. The next section is the Forge Village section. Frank Murphy and Bert Connors of Lowell spent Sunday as guests of Francis Lowther. Messrs. Murphy and Connors were members of the Jolly Campers Club, who have engaged one of Mr. Lowther's camps at Forge Pond for the season. They expect to take possession on Memorial Day. A large team load of provisions will be shipped from Lowell this week. John Wiggum of Waltham visited with relatives here on Sunday. Mrs. Ernest Mountain left last Tuesday morning for the Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, where she expects to undergo an operation later. Mrs. Walter Mountain and two children of Ware will remain to act as housekeeper until Mrs. Ernest Mountain arrives home. W.H. Harty, H-A-R-T-Y, of the United States Navy, spent last week visiting with his parents, Mr. and Mrs. W.H.P. Harty. Mr. Hardy enlisted in the Navy for five years and has already served three years. He is a first-class machinist on the submarine Snapper, now stationed at the Charlestown Navy Yard, where she is undergoing repairs. He has had the experience of being underwater 120 feet for 12 hours. I might mention the Snappers, uh, a little bit about the Snapper. Its keel was laid at Four River Shipbuilding Company in Quincy under a subcontract from Electric Boat Company. It was the first of three U.S. Navy ships named for this fish. Snapper was launched June 16, 1908 and commissioned on February 2, 1910 under command of Lieutenant Chester W. Nimitz. Born in 1885, died in 1966. Uh, admiral Nimitz, uh, actually he became a fleet admiral, that is a five-star admiral, uh, during World War II when he was in charge of all of the Allied fleets in the Pacific Ocean. He was also the submarine czar of the U.S. Navy. Memorial Day exercises will be held in Abbott Hall on next Friday evening, May 27th. An excellent program will be given by the children, consisting of readings and songs in keeping with the day. The children have for many years held Decoration Day exercises at the school and afterwards marched to West Lawn Cemetery, where the deceased soldiers' graves have been strewn with flowers and a flag planted. This year will be no exception. 
In order to accommodate the large number of people who attend, it has been arranged to hold the exercises in the hall. Everyone here is invited. And of course, Decoration Day from 100 years ago is what we call Memorial Day now. The concert to be held in Abbott Hall on Wednesday evening, May 25th, to be the best of its kind, is, is to be the best of its kind held here for some time. The artists are all well known in musical circles and include, among others, Mrs. Oliver Wellington Priest of Portsmouth Contralto, Miss Ember Emma Engelman from the Whitney School, Boston, soprano, and Miss Varen G. Lowe of the Emerson School of Oratory will be the reader. The Forge Village Lions were defeated by the Graniteville Blues on the home grounds Saturday afternoon. Spinner pitched his usual good ball, but received wretched support. He allowed but six hits. McCarthy pitched for the Blues. Today the Lions will play the Crescents of Lowell on the home grounds and will have some new men in the lineup. Kidder of Air will assist in pitching, and it is hoped that he will make good. This will be the third game to be played in the Stony Brook League. The Lions will have to do some tall hustling in order to be in the race for the pennant. The next paragraph is called, Soon Put Out. Fire was discovered in the nick of time Friday evening of last week in the freight shed at the Boston and Main Station, causing considerable excitement for a time. Some cotton waste, which was among a number of large cans filled with kerosene, which is used for the switch lamps, was on fire. One can of oil exploded, and this drew the attention of several persons who were on the station platform awaiting the arrival of the 6.30 mail train from Ayer to Lowell. Several members of the John Edwards Hose Company were present, and through their presence of mind in removing the large amount of inflammable material, the fire was not allowed to spread further. Edward T. Han Hanley was on the scene immediately with a fire extinguisher, and, his, and this, together with the bucket brigade, soon had the fire under control. It was only due to the efforts of the firemen that the entire station was not burned to the ground. Besides the large amount of oil stored on the sh in the shed, there was also a considerable quantity of highly explosive material which is used on the railroad, and had the fire continued but a short time, the building would have been wrecked. The cause of the fire is not known. Next, we have the Graniteville section. A freak show visited here on Monday night. They put freak in quotes. The principal attraction being a so-called wild man that, quote, eat him alive, end quote. He was heavily chained, but one of the boys took hold of his, har of his harness and, quote, quote, had him going, end quote, for a few minutes so that he called for assistance. The show terminated shortly thereafter, and those in charge of the exhibition have no doubt formed the opinion that they struck the wrong town. What promises to be a red-hot ball game will be played here next Wednesday afternoon at 6.15 o'clock when the has-beens will meet the regular Graniteville team. These two clubs played some interesting games here last season, and the has-beens are out to trim the, the speed boys if possible. Bob McCarthy will have charge of the has-beens team and has gathered together a strong ag aggregation that is well drilled on inside baseball. P. Henry Harrington, treasurer of Court Graniteville, Foresters of America, and F. G. Sullivan, chief ranger of the same court, attended the Grand Court Convention that was held in Haverhill the past week. Jack Berry, the loyal baseball fan, has recently returned from a visit to the western part of the state and will be found on the sidelines rooting for Graniteville during the season. The lumber has arrived for the new house which is to be erected on 4th Street by George Gilson. Work will be commenced in a very few days. P. Henry Harrington has the contract. A social dancing party was held in Healy's Hall on Saturday evening and was a great success. A prize waltz was the, the attraction, which was won by Miss Kitty Rafferty and M.E. Piney, both of this village. 
and the last section is the About Town section. John A. Healy has bought the Flushing Pond woodlot owned by Mrs. Sarah N. Bacon of Albany, New York. This lot has a commanding view of Flushing Pond, is on the Groton Road, and the electric cars form the southern boundary. A summer cottage will soon be part of the attractions. Mrs. Bacon, the recent owner, will be remembered as a sister of Mason Harlow for years in the employ of the True with her, True with the Kai's farm on Francis Hill, which is still there. The Women's Alliance of the Unitarian Churches of the towns of Littleton, Shirley, Chelmsford, and the city of Lowell met with the Alliance of the Unitarian Church Westford Thursday afternoon. An address was given by Reverend Arthur W. Littlefield of Brookline on, quote, the growth of Unitarianism, end quote. At the close of a luncheon, at the close, a luncheon was served by the hospitality of the Westford Alliance. The large forest fire Tuesday northwest of Flushing and sought for ponds covered parts of the towns of Westford, Tingsboro, and Dunstable near Scribner Hill. It got beyond control several times after feigning quit. That's the news in Westford for the week ending May 21st, 1910. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Westford Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.